And say, I'll also point out that we hate doing proper introductions. So we tend to avoid it where we can. <laughs> so it may be that you suddenly find we've just kind of started. <coughs> so today we have got a podcast of three voices. We have decided that after, what, 23 episodes is it now? I think so. I actually have no idea. <laughs> professionalism anyway after a lot of episodes we decided that finally we should bring a bit of actual knowledge and experience onto the podcast so we've invited the one and only gareth anstey driver of dystopia i'm the knowledge and experience am i <laughs> <laughs> now I'm, i've kind of got your cv your roboteering cv in front of me but just make sure i'm getting this right in terms of heavyweights dystopia trolley rage and the upcoming general demeanor yep we've got utopia in the lighter weights and I can never remember the ant weight. Help me. Dystopiant? Yeah, dystopiant and defectant. Defectant, that's the other one, of course. To go through them, basically, the heavyweights I've got is dystopia. That's my oldest one. Uh, that's what I compete in the UK championships with and currently rebuilding it. Uh, general demeanour and trolley rage are with the University of Greenwich. Then featherweights, which is um, the weight class that Utopia is in. I also used to have another featherweight called Defector, who, again, I've got the two separate systems at the moment, but... Because I'm only one person, I tend to swap them between them each year. So um, last year I used both of them. This year uh, I'm probably going to use Utopia. I've got a new system as well, so I'm trying to work out exactly what I want. Unfortunately, the problem I have at the moment is that all my robots are destroyed. Um, the unfortunate thing with robot combat is you do lo lose a load of robots. Then beta weights, um, that's 1.5 kilos. I've got RPM and Ascension. Then for my ant weights, it's Defectant and uh, Dystopian. Where where do you keep all of these robots? Um, unfortunately enough, a lot after a lot of events, they flat pack quite nicely. Um, <laughs> but in various places, like uh, the, the the Beatles and the ants, I kept I keep on the dashboard in my van. Sometimes I go to work and show people them, because um, especially with my work as well, sometimes it's always about. Uh, your relationship with your customer and if you're like yeah look at this cool thing uh it goes quite well then the featherweights i tend to keep in my bedroom either in my closet or you know on shelves and that then the heavyweight has to go in the garage fair enough <laughs> so with that uh i mean it's almost an army at this point isn't it yeah. an army of robots you've got i've got about 10 of them i think at the moment absolute madness they're in various states at the moment um Certainly, as I say, I'm rebuilding Dystopia. Utopia is completely wrecked at the moment from the world champs. But they're all in various states, so trying to get them up and running again for this year. With with all those robots, how many how many like transmitters and receivers do you have? Like do you have to keep like swapping receivers around between them, or have you got a receiver in all of them and then one transmitter with loads of things programmed in it? Or have you just got a pair for all of them? So I've in total got three transmitters. Um one of them is for the University of Greenwich robots. Uh, purely so they just ha they they have all of their own stuff because uh, that means that health and safety wise I'm not bringing my own tools into the university they've literally just got a box there with all the robot parts I need all that's kind of separate it is me but at the same time it's separate from me um, then I've got two transmitters of my own um, which basically all the championship robots are bound to one transmitter and then all the secondary robots are bound to another I probably have about six receivers. Um, I rarely ever need to take a receiver out, but sometimes it happens. So this really, for you, is kind of a full-time hobby, isn't it? Yeah, it's, you're always either thinking about it or repairing and do, doing various little bits. I mean, even, say, for example, at the moment, I'm not really doing much in terms of ant weights. Um, I'm still thinking of, you know, I've just bought some new parts for my featherweight. I'm currently designing the new heavyweight. Um, and I had a disc arrive for the beetle weight last week. So again, I'm going to be probably assembling that over the weekend. All various things. You don't tend to just work on one robot throughout like a day. You tend to just mix and match little bits here and there kind of thing. And this is kind of the thing that we want to focus on today is that the sport is largely a hobby and there's so much going on that we don't see on TV. So we're sort of looking to pick your brains here on the whole gamut of the live scene. So, f first of all, just again, on a personal note, how many live events do you reckon you attend in a year? Uh, me, personally, about 15 normally, maybe up to 20. It depends. Good Lord! <laughs> it depends, really, what you count as a live event. Um, certainly for Extreme Robots, I think they do about eight or nine a year. Uh, robots Live do another three. You have um, 
in 2016, we had two events for Robo Challenge, the featherweights, then we got beta weights as well, and there's ant weights on top of that. Then, um, even for me, especially because I do things with the University of Greenwich, I have sort of little live events which no one else really attends, uh, purely just to work with the schools and so on. So, um, obviously, not a live event, but I do have people coming in and working with them on robots in a, a demonstrative kind of fashion, as it were. Fair enough. That's immediately far more activity than I thought when when Ryan asked that I was expecting you to say maybe like six or seven events <laughs> and again this really does show the scale of what we miss if we just look at what's happening on tv we've got all these competitions going on with all of these different weight classes and we're hoping you can kind of demystify some of this for us so if we kind of jump in the first thing we want to do is really look at the heavyweights so the weight class that people are used to the weight class that people are possibly going to be the most interested in if they were going to go to a live event for the first time. Now, something I noticed you did there is you mentioned things like Robots Live, etc. What events are currently running for heavyweights in the UK? So at the moment, we have Extreme Robots and Robots Live. They're the two main heavyweight event uh, organisers in the UK. Uh, Robots Live do probably about three, four main events a year. They do a lot of side events as well. So I think they go to the Fleet Air or like uh, an air aircraft museums, uh, that kind of... They, they're a sideshow at some events. MCM, I think, has them in Birmingham for the NEC. Little, little side events. So you could do probably up to about 10 a year of them, maybe. Uh, same with Extreme Robots. They tend to be just big uh, events, more more showmen um, in their events as well. It's There's probably about, I think there's eight or so a year for them. And again, they're all around the UK, mostly in the South, but... It's quite, it's quite varied. Then you also have um, in Ireland. There's uh, the Deer Tour team run their own event in January as well as an additional. Oh, is that uh, is that Mechatron? Mechatron, yes. Yeah, is that the one I've seen? It's, yeah. It's the BT um, Young Scientist Convention or some, it's something along that um, that line. So with all of these different events. Are they all running slightly different rule sets, or is there something sort of overriding that they're all working with in terms of rules? So everyone runs the FRA rules. Um, now, the difference between all the events is what grade of arena they have. So Robots Live has a netted roof. That means they can't run spinners above 500 RPM, uh, so on. Whereas Extreme Robots has a polycarb roof where they allow spinners up to 125 mile an hour, I think. However, both of them run to the same base rule set, which is the FRA. It's just because of the grading of the arena, they are allowed certain things uh, in the Extreme Robots arena that you're not allowed in Robots Live. So just for context on the speed of spinners and stuff, can you give a sense of how fast the spinners move on like the televised Robot Wars? Because that's, I think, what certainly what I'm most familiar with in terms of just sort of a sense of how fast they go. So as compared to that, what, you know, what does a 500 RPM spinner look like? How much damage can that do? So a 500 RPM spinner... Uh, that would probably be something like nuts one, maybe. Uh, it really depends on the diameter that it spins at, because uh, obviously the larger diameter, the higher the tip speed. Um, in terms of 125 mile an hour, that's pretty much exactly half the maximum allowed at Robo Wars. The maximum at Robo Wars being 250 mile an hour. Um, so I think Aftershock comes in about 140 in its Series 9 appearance, so it's not too far below uh aftershock in order to get into that one two five so i i noticed as well you switched between like rpm and tip speed as well so in in, in this uh event with the netted roof they there's no is there like not particularly a limit on tip speed is it's just the rpm of the drive or is it or is there a bit more to it than that um so the reason for the netted roof the rpm is based uh because there's three criteria that you need to fit with um i've never what i've never run tried to run a spinner in these arenas so um, I think one of them is RPM, the other one is diameter. And basically, with all, with the three criteria, if you break any of them, you need to submit to the EO. Uh, basically, if you put these three criteria together, you would get tip speed. But it's just sometimes tip speed's not the most important thing. You know, you need to look at other factors as well. So, realistically, are there any spinning weapons that would be effective within that rule set? Or is it something you just don't see in those events? Uh, realistically, no. And that said, Nuts 1 uh, was very effective. Nuts 1 managed to come fifth in the UK in 2016. Um, and while spinning, it actually probably done its first snipe um, on Dystopia that I can remember, actually. Because uh, I used to have a, a safety cord on 
Dystopia, which basically, when upside down, you could still de deactivate Dystopia. Um, I used to leave that hanging over the robot, just purely, it, it's something I didn't have to do, but it made the robot a bit more safe. Nuts managed to grab that safety cord and rip the internal uh, wiring out, <laughs> which t turned the robot off, obviously, it fail safe. So, yeah, it was a bit annoying in the sense that I tried to uh, be as safe as possible, and going above and beyond, uh, I got nuts. Nice. So presumably, within this rule set, the knockout criteria are roughly the same to what we're used to from TV. Yes, the main difference would really be with things like judges' decisions. Um, in the TV rule set, we have subjective scoring, where basically at the end of the fight, they give you one to five based on how well they think you've done. Uh, whereas in the sporting context, we have objective-based scoring, where basically every engagement you do, you'll get a score for that based on what you do in that engagement and how you come out of that engagement. And then obviously all those engagements get added up at the end to give you a final score there. That's probably the biggest difference in terms of judging and uh, pinning rules and so on. They're mostly the same. So can you explain a bit more about this judging? Because I already like the sound of this compared to what we're seeing on TV. What In what way would an engagement be scored? So it's the same three criteria, basically, either control, aggression and damage. Um, to, base, to make it at a very base level, if you was to attack someone to take the fight towards them, you're being aggressive. Let's say that's a point. Um, if you then attack them with your weapon and fire your weapon off, imagining it's a flipper, then you'll get another point. Um, and then obviously if that higher attack is successful, you may get control point on top of that. So you've scored in all three criteria, let's say. Whereas maybe if someone attacks you, you're not being aggressive, but you may be able to counter-attack them. Uh, let's say you have a drum spinner. Maybe you hit their leading edge, and that gives, that's your good control because you're able to take the attack and put it back towards them, and then obviously you score damage to them as well by damaging them. So, yeah, each engagement is marked on those three criteria, and it's basically how well you do in each criteria that means how many marks you get. Are there particularly any like arena hazards in the live event arenas and if there are how how do they factor into the scoring like if you do a lot of damage without ever actually using your weapon and do it entirely by you know arena hazards do you would you get any points for for damage there or is it or would that all be just aggression points um it it doesn't tend to be a sense that we like analyze the robot after the fight to see how much damage it's got unless it's a very close decision like one-on-one -on -one versus hit with this kind of thing um it tends to be more that it's basically every engagement you do. So like Gabriel scores a lot of points because it's constantly attacking. It's constantly going back and forth and landing hits. It's constantly, you know, taking the fight. It's constantly hitting someone. It's constantly causing damage to them. Um, then the arena hazards, we don't tend to have many. Um, the biggest ones are the pit, obviously. Uh, you can get someone into the pit. Though in live events, it's not uncommon for someone to get back out of the pit before the 10 seconds is up. Then we also have, in some arenas like uh, Ropes Live, they have some hammers, which are normally controlled by the audience. Or there is an arena flipper, which, again, it doesn't tend to fire that much, but it is there. So that, that pit sounds a bit different to the like the Robot Wars arena, in that you mentioned that you can, you, you've you got 10 seconds to get back out of it again. Mm. So the way we do with the mobilisation rules, uh, essentially, is that you have 10 seconds from whenever you go into this immobilised state to recover from it. So that includes the pit. The, the, the issue we have with live event arenas is that, obviously, we have to build these inside sports halls and so on. They're not very happy for us to drill a hole in their floor. So we have so however high we can get the arena is however deep the pit can be. So, um, so I guess that means you're often there with a much shallower pit, I suppose, so it's much more easy to get a robot out of it again. Yeah, so it's quite common for flippers especially but to, to try and get themselves upside down in the pit and then flip themselves back out of it again. Yeah. Does that um does that same rule apply for out of the arena? If you get flipped out of the arena, is is there is there a way back in for one? And if there were, is that allowed? It used to be the case that um in Roman robots, uh, which is now extreme robots, they used to have an area like on one side where if you got flipped out on that one side, there'd be a barrier that lowered, and you could try and drive to it and drive back into the arena for like one chance. Um, then it depends on basically every weight con uh, competition. So for featherweights, it tends to be a case that if you get flipped out, um, 
you're not allowed to be immobile again, but you will still get that 10 seconds. So if someone's being, if someone's being counted out when you're flipped out, you won't lose to them because they were being counted out before you. But at the same time, then, say, beta weights, for example, we tend to have the rule that if you bounce off the wall and bounce back into the arena, not landing in the outer arena zone, then you are allowed to continue, just basically because it's so hectic and the power to weight and those things, it's starting to get a little bit silly. So Wow. I was going to say, the lightweight classes, from what I've seen, are just ridiculous in every way. In terms of the power to weight ratios of those machines, it's absolutely ridiculous. And we'll, I'm looking forward to getting onto those later as well, actually. So sticking with the heavyweights for a second, what sort of competition formats are we seeing? Are we talking straight knockout tournaments? Are these tournaments lasting over the year in different venues? It really depends on who's running the tournament and what time we have and how many people are there. We tend to pretty much organise the tournament on the day. Um, the UK Championships tends to follow the format of a freeway melee first round. Uh, the winner goes through and then it's straight knockout from there on. Um, then you may have losers melee. It changes every year depending on how many people are there and what's the best setup we can do. Uh, certainly in 2016, for example, I went through two melees uh, before then going into 1v1s. Um, in the second melee, it was actually two go through out of three, so we both agreed just to gang up on Falcon Storm. <laughs> <laughs> with the, sorry, just, just with the tournament structure quickly... Um, if are all these like if if you got is each tournament like a self contained thing over the course of maybe three days or would you or is there more like in in the world of football and stuff where you've got a tournament that maybe lasts you know several weeks or whatever where you've got like a, a round of heats on one week and then a month or two later you've got another round and all that kind of stuff. It depends on the tournament. Um, most of them are contained within that. Some tournaments, for example, they may if you come to other events you may get an advantage like a seeding. Um, however, you won't actually uh, say you don't need to come to these previous events in order to get into the later events, as you may like with a football tournament. So football, obviously, if you, if you don't send your quarterfinal match, you're not getting into the finals. Then, But at these live events, for example, Dystopia um, in 2015, I was repairing it throughout the first half of the year. So there was four events, four qualification events in that year, and everyone got points based on how well they'd done. Uh, Dystopia only came to the fourth qualification event and won. Um, so going into the World Champs that year, which was the Robot Wars World Championships, um, Dystopia was seed of sixth because it got so many points just winning that one event. Uh, that seed, and, you know, the, there's a lot of robots there that had not been to any of the other events, but obviously that seed and meant I avoided all the other seeds. So again, it really depends on the tournament. It's sometimes it's just the EO wants to have a bigger tournament over several events sometimes they just want to have a, one tournament they can do over the weekend and let the uh, whoever attends that weekend follow them so you talk about qualification there is that qualification in the sense that we recognize it from other sports where certain tournaments you literally have to qualify into or is this more a question of it is as you say advantageous to get yourself seeded um in those tournaments it tends to just be advantageous to get yourself seeded it can really depend. Certainly now we're coming to a point where in the lo in the lower weight classes we have so many people wanting to attend that we are having to do either selection criteria or just basically cutting off and saying, right, everyone else is now a reserve. Um, certainly, for example, the UWE, we had to cut people off. That was for beta weights. Um, it got up to 50 sign-ups um, and in the end got up to 70. So we just had to cut it back and say these 48 are in the competition all the others are reserves. Uh, similarly for uh, Insomnia, which is the FRA World Championships for featherweights, they do have a selection criteria, so a lot of people do get either rejected or put into the reserves. It's interesting you say that, because I know that Robo Games have had this problem for this year in particular, where I, I think they've now started limiting the number of entries a team can have, haven't they? Purely due to being oversubscribed. Is that something that we're moving towards now in terms of having a healthy scene of UK heavyweights that's almost outgrowing the events? Um, I wouldn't say that at the moment. If everyone turned up in one go, then probably yes. Unfortunately, uh, though, not everyone always turns up to every event. So that's what some events we may, you may turn up and think, oh, no one's here. Uh, whilst other events, like say UK champs or the European champs, you turn up and there's about 36 robots signed up. So if we had gone out well, if we wanted to enter, how would we go about it? 
Um, the most important thing is to sign up to the FRA uh, forums. Just basically have a look through there, learn the knowledge, and so on. Um, in that, as soon as you've done that, just basically find the events that are on there and turn up. Uh, if you have the working robot, you'll have to do a tech check. Uh, just basically health and safety. Make sure that your robot passes all the safety regulations. And assuming that you've got a working robot that passes all the safety regulations, regardless of whether it's a really good one or if it just barely moves, it'll get into a fight. So with this health and safety stuff, how what how how is a robot deemed safe? Like what is that procedure? And like sort of like with, within that question, I guess I'm sort of trying to ask, you know, how much does your reputation influence that? Like if you're if you're going there as someone who's been in the scene for ages and ages and ages, everyone knows you. Is, is there like a sense of trust there versus if, if I turned up completely out of the blue with a robot, are they going to be more, is it, is it harder to sort of pass that tech check stuff? It's still the same base tech check. You st everyone still has to pass the same things. Um, the only issue would be if you're new, for example, they may ask you additional questions. Like if you've got pneumatics inside, they may ask you basic questions about the rules and the safety pneumatics. Like, what pressure you're running at, or say you've got a spinner, for example, they'll ask you what tip speed you have, uh, things that you should really know, and it just basically proves comp uh, competence to know, but it's not, you don't technically need to know it for the tech check so long as it's below, you know, it. if it has if it has the um, 80, uh, the 1000 PSI blow off valve um, for the pressure relief valve, then that's what passes the tech check, whether or not you know how much pressure you're running at, you don't tend to get asked, but at the same time, you may be asked if you're new just purely because you, you need to make sure that people have actually, they realise what they've built. <laughs> yeah. So with the with that like pneumatics and stuff like that, I this is maybe a bit of a uh, a naive thing to be asking. But like, so if you've got, how much difference does it make, I guess, for having like a robot that's built primarily of like off the shelf parts, if you know what I mean? Like if you've got, if you've got that valve and some like pre-built, pneumatic systems and stuff put that in versus if you custom machined the whole lot you've got a custom machined chassis custom machined um, like pressure vessel that you've got and then a custom made or everything else completely custom fabricated like not for sale anywhere how is, is is there one side of that that's deemed safer than the other are you more likely to be accepted if you've used off-the-shelf parts or is it a sense of oh you successfully built it therefore you know that's probably going to be good so it really depends on the year you know. um so what they'll probably ask... Sorry, what was that? The EO. What does that mean? The the event organiser, sorry. Okay. Um, it's one of... it's So they'll probably ask you for a pressure test. Uh, if you, ta you take it to a commercial company and they've pressure tested your components to make sure... To basically state that below this pressure, these things will not blow up. So that's so you can take it to someone, they'll fill your tank up to whatever pressure it was and then you'll get like a certificate, I guess, or some kind of certification that that is acceptable yeah so the easy ones are for example fire extinguisher bottles where you can just take it to a fire extinguisher refill uh not tell them what it is and just basically put it in for a stamp uh in which case it'll have 10 okay. <laughs> it'll have 10 years based on um on when it was last recorded so presumably this is a process that you go through every time you turn up to an event rather than just doing it once and the robot being signed off oh yeah you need to you need to tech check every time you come to an event, and sometimes you may even need to tech check more than once at an event, uh, especially if you take heavy damage. Um, for example, it may even be possible sometimes for a robot which previously passed the tech check to now fail it due to damage, uh, and then that's the EO's decision on based on how they're going to go about things. Uh, this actually happened to me at Insomnia, for example, where Utopia uh, took some damage, uh, where effectively the locking bar for the weapon you could it would start the fight with the locking bar in and the, it worked perfectly however at the end of the fight because the uh, mechanism was slightly twisted you'd have to put your hand on the robot to insert it back in so in that case it would fail tech check but because you could arm it up safely uh, and so on and it was known it wasn't intentional and it was battle damage then i think i think they, they said it's fine but get it sorted for the next event sort of thing that reminds me of a really weird dream i had a few nights ago where <laughs> sorry, sorry this is way off topic but it's it's kind of on topic i had a dream where for some reason i was at a live event with what seemed awfully similar to the new version of deator 
And I, I was in the pits, really competent, knowing exactly what I was doing. And then I realised that I hadn't put my restraining bar in and I woke up in a cold sweat. <laughs> Aww, I spent Ryan. so much time reading over rules and things recently, it's starting to get in my head. <laughs> That's ridiculous. So, I mean, at an event, how seriously would a safety violation like that be taken? It can, again, it will depend on the EO. Uh, certainly if you're at Robo Challenge, for example, they're the people who do the tech checks and so on at Robot Wars. Um, they're extremely serious they very competent people they know a lot about their stuff and so on so any safety violations will be very seriously considered um other events it really it really depends on the eo because it, at the end of the day it's the eo who's the one who's enforcing it um sometimes you may have a robot which doesn't have a power light um in which case they'll allow it i mean for example i once had a case where i was running an event and we had an rc toilet uh, technically, it didn't pass the tech check, but it was so hilarious, and it was, you know, it's, it's an RC toy car that you passed it anyway. That sounds kind of like an almost Team Tiki style entry. I'm thinking of the butter passing robot from last year's Robo Games in particular. So, thinking now about, you know, people that aren't necessarily going to have the time, energy, skill, whatever to build, what could someone expect when they go to a heavyweight live event? Uh, in terms of to watch, is it? Yeah, to watch. So, for example, how many fights are you going to get in an average session? So, your average session will have nine fights. They normally split it up to five before the interval, and then there'll be another four maybe after the interval. It really depends on, again, which competition you're going to see. So, if you're going to see Extreme Robots, for example, they have a lot of side things going on as well, where it's a very much it's a production show, as it were. Uh, so, you're, go you're going to see an entire show, not just the fights. Whereas Robot Live, it's very much more about getting to see the roboteers and getting to see the behind the scenes, that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, it can, it, Robots Live, for example, you can see boxing robots. They have those, which are really great fun. Uh, both shows, they have uh, Skelly from Techno Games. Uh, climbing, oh, wow, that's old. You can, yeah, cl they're climbing a rope. Um, little, there are a lot of fun things that you can see as well as the fights. It's normally about nine, and then there'll be four shows over a weekend on average. So it sounds to me like at some events it is more about the fighting, at others it is more about putting on a show. Is that a fair statement? Yes. If there's a championship, people will take it seriously. Um, so, for example, I say Extreme Robots, they're about putting on a show, which is totally fair. But if there's, they do do championships as well. And so, for example, the last championship I done, Extreme Robots, my semi-final fight, I won in two seconds, which is purely because it's a, you know, it's a championship fight. However, you Michael Oates it. Yeah, however, in the same sense that if we're doing um, a sort of a show fight, the the last um, show I attended with General Demeanor, we had a fight with five robots and two of them got stuck, stuck together. You know, I could just drive into the arena and celebrate, you know, say they're stuck, I'm, uh, I'm happy with the win, but, you know, you try to separate them, you try to help them to keep going. And just, you know, you, you you want the fight to go three minutes so the audience can enjoy it. And pretty much so you can just have a little kick around. <laughs> so this is as much fun for you as it is for the audience. This isn't necessarily intense competition. I would say so. No. It, I mean, if the spinner's in, there's a, it's obviously a different um, ball game because obviously the potential for damage is so high. But it really depends on who you're fighting. Like if I'm fighting for a can opener, that is a pretty serious fight. Just purely because of what they can do to your robot if you let them. Mm. But... I mean, certainly if you're going up against, say, like, uh, Behemoth, for example. I fought Behemoth several times, and it, Behemoth never runs out of gas. Dystopia's got a load of gas, so we just keep flipping each other all the time. <laughs> and, you know, and it goes on for quite a while. I was going to say, you're just out trying to have fun. You you are trying to beat each other, but at the same time, if you beat someone, you'll then help them recover, and you can kind of keep score throughout the fight, rather than just taking, you know, <laughs> rather than just winning and then stopping. Is there is there a general feeling among roboteers, I guess, around people who build powerful spinners? Because you sort of mentioned that, that if someone's coming with a spinner, that changes that fight a little bit. So that 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 I imagine, like, I always love seeing spinners because the, the the merciless destruction is is often quite fun to watch. But is there is there a sense among the roboteers of sort of like actually we'd rather we'd rather people didn't do that. We'd rather they built different weapons that are that can still win fights but aren't going to completely decimate us and stuff like that. I think with spinners, when we're not doing championship fights, when we're doing fun uh, family entertainment, as it were, there is a bit of a problem with every two or three weeks having to fight spinners again. Um, 
But at the same time, there are a lot of people out there who will happily fight spinners over and over again. Gabriel is one that comes to mind. Um, you know, it's it, it really depends on the person. Uh, personally, I haven't fought a spinner in a live event arena yet because I've always been using, using the university's robots so far. But at the same time, it's it's personal preference. But at the same time, with a spinner, you can't play friendly. So if you're if you're if you're at one of these events and you're going through the tournament structure and then you you, you get drawn against a spinner, can you can you just withdraw from that fight and give them the win without having to risk completely destroying <laughs> your robot? Is that something that's allowed to happen, or or is it sort of the like crackers and smash approach? Yeah, or is it you've got to have you got to sort of you know go and fight them a little bit and maybe just sort of pit yourself or something? Um. So when you sign up to the event, you're either going for whiteboards or you're going in for the championship. If you're going in for the championship, you go in against whoever you're drawn, and that will be spinners at Extreme Robots. Uh, Robot Slide is not going to be spinners, but um, at Extreme Robots, it certainly will probably be spinners in the championship. If you don't want to fight the spinners, you're just going for the whiteboards. And so they they're just that they're not competitions. They're just what are they just fights that fill time, or is it like a separate tournament that runs alongside it, or or what? They're basically just fights that. For the, for the audience more than anything. Uh, the, the the reason they get their name is basically because there's the whiteboard written on with the show plan of what fight's going to be where, and basically you go up to it as a pen and you write your name down on one of the fights. <laughs> Fair enough. That's good. I, that's, that's good to hear that there's sort of like an option for those who, like, if you a bit more budget-oriented maybe and don't want to don't splash down the cash for a... Uh, to have your robot destroyed that's that's quite quite nice that there's that option to avoid yeah it. these heavyweight shows as well they do featherweights as well um there's going to be two featherweight fights every event um or every show in the event um and then one of them is for non-spinners one of them is for spinners so eventually what you're probably going to see is that those spinner fights are basically 10 spinners just going out and destroying each other or being too scared to do <laughs> so whereas the non-spinners it's um obviously just friendly it was interesting earlier that when you mentioned different robots you sort of gravitated towards ones that we've seen on tv and i think it'd be especially interesting for people to hear that you fear a robot like can opener who on the tv series kind of got nowhere but by live event standards i realize he's very destructive what sort of recognizable names and faces would you see from tv and what would be the less well-known names to watch um i think probably the biggest less well-known name is actually probably one of the most well-known names which is manta Manto is the current UK champion and is owned by the same team as Aftershock and Shockwave. They're owned by Will Thomas and Ian Thomas. Um, it's one of the best robots out there. I've lost to it many times. I've fought it many times. I've not won as many. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but at least some. Yeah, but as I say, it's one of those uh, robots which is not well known if you don't know the live events because Manta never got on the TV show. But at the same time, when you look at the team, you'll be like, I know who they are. You, you, you mentioned that they own that robot. Is, is, is that a wording because they didn't build it and they've bought it? Or is it just you just generally talk about who owns it and not really worry too much about who builds the things? No, Manta was entirely built uh, by the team. Um, okay, cool. It's, yeah, <laughs> I, can't, I can't think of a word, word to describe it. It's, it's one of the things where they built it so long ago, I just say that they have it now. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, that's, that's it's, it's, I, I wasn't sure if that was a specific choice of word. No, it's not. It's, um, I mean, the thing is as well, it can be a trigger's brooms uh, situation sometimes with some robots where there are people who have bought robots, but they've done so much to it since that they basically built it anyway. <laughs> Something else that I think is potentially confusing for people coming in with knowledge of the TV series, is that there are robots you will see on the live scene under one name that we've seen compete on TV under another. So I'm thinking particularly about, I think it's Hansy that High Five goes by as the live scene, and Brutus for Cobra. What's, what, what's going on there? Is this a choice by the teams, or is this a contracts thing? What's happening? Uh, it re it's really case by case. Um, some robots may change their names just to be more TV friendly. I think Draven had to do that back because um, back in when it entered the original Robot Wars, because I remember it being a different name before and called Anthrax maybe or something similar. Um, then, but obviously robots change names just purely because either they make them more marketable or in some cases, for example, like Pulsar to Magneta, uh, basically production looks at it and thinks, oh wow, it's an all new robot, we haven't seen this before. <laughs> and actually it's the same thing. But it, obviously it's one of those things where 
like Gabriel, for example, I, I've never heard anyone call it Gabriel too on the live scene, but <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things where you're you're trying to do things for production to make it appealing, whereas on the live scene you just call it by what you wanted to call it. The other one that springs to mind now, I come to think of it, is Beta, which I believe competed in one or two live events as Basher. Um, no, I don't think it ever... It has been to live events, um, and it has tested at live events. I think they tested the hammer once at a Robots Live event. I say, I've seen a photo of its hammerhead stuck in the yeah, floor. They, they, That's where I got the idea it might have they, they, did, they did test it once, and I, I think I remember being there when they did it. But I, I, don't, be, I don't remember Beta ever um, fighting in the Robots Live arena. It, there probably will be a video of an event I didn't attend where, where it did, but... <laughs> I know that it, can be, it entered under the name Basher in the pilot. It's probably one of the reasons why there's no videos of the pilot because um, obviously the BattleBots contracts and so on. So the reason I ask is obviously we've got a lot of British teams competing overseas at the moment in various competitions. I, I don't know if you know about this. I don't know if you can even comment on this, but is there a chance that we're going to see some of those on the live scene when they return? Um, it really depends on which competition they're entering. So BattleBox, for example, I don't know the current uh, contract negotiations but certainly all the series one and two for the reboots they are allowed to compete on the live scene photo and storm for example i said earlier i fought against it in the uk championships um it's probably just the case that they don't want to i mean for example terahertz probably it fights whenever john reed's there and if you're trying to run two heavyweights it's a bit handful mm, i'll bet <laughs> basically what i'm saying is can i see spectre on the live scene that's what i'm really asking here <laughs> I mean, I don't see the Coopers at many live events, um, I'll be honest, because they're, they're very busy people, I imagine. I was going to say, I imagine they must be super busy. Yeah, they, they do have a lot of TV contracts, as far as I'm aware. But at the same time, you know, when we when they do come, we could see them. It's perfectly possible. There's a lot of people who used to compete a lot more who maybe don't now so much. Uh, for example, Dave Moulds was an original UK heavyweight champion with Turbulence. Mm. Um he doesn't do the heavyweight live scene so much anymore, but he does compete at the featherweight level quite actively. It's interesting as well that I think we sort of mentioned this shift towards spinners for Robot Wars. Is the dominance of flippers on the live scene a competitive thing or more of a design choice that people just enjoy building them? Um, it certainly used to be a case that the design of the arenas was a lot worse. Um, we've since started limiting the arenas, so now you can only flip out on one side, for example, or only flip out in certain areas, a bit like Robot Wars. Whereas before, it used to be a case that you could pretty much flip out on three sides of the arena. Um, so it probably back in those days, flippers dominated purely because the arena favoured them. Um, nowadays, it's it's hard to say exactly why. I think the the lack of spinners, the spinners are probably the natural counter to the flipper because obviously with the heavy pneumatics, it's going to have a weaker armour. Um, and then Rambots, for example, they can't really deal with the flippers because eventually the flipper's going to get underneath them and do something to them. So the most successful robots probably will be Axes, uh, Terra Hertz is two-time UK champion, Big Nipper, two-time UK champion. Then, yeah, as, as I say, you're always going to have the robots that are flippers, crushers, Axes, be the most successful because they, they only counter each other, whereas the Rambot kind of has to take their punishment, but it can't really deal much to them in return. So it sounds to me that overall we're seeing a much greater variety of winners on the live scene. Yeah, if you were to look at uh, the UK champions from the past so many years, a lot of them are flippers. Um, but as when we look at Robot Wars, for example, Carbide's been in the final all three times. Uh, Eruption's been in the final two of those times, and then Apollo uh, the other time. So there probably is a bit more variety on the live scene. But at the same time, because of the limitation, a lot of the robots do follow the same kind of generic design, whereas Robot Wars is that it, it can actually force people to be different, like PP3D, for example. Hmm. So I suppose, again, I'm thinking, I'm almost thinking about back to football, where I think people have reached a point where they're getting bored of competitions where the same people look like winning all the time. And I think one of the things that really appeals to me about the live scene is that it seems like anybody could be anybody. Yeah, that's that is definitely the case. The thing, the thing about Robot Wars, for example, is that Toxic Two, Manta, and so on are not going to get on to Robot Wars whilst Apollo is fighting. Uh, Iron or Iron or Six, for example, again, a ve very similar design. If you have all three, four of those robots, they look very similar next to each other. As such, a TV show is only ever going to pick one or two of them to actually appear on the show. 
But the thing is, if they're four of the best robots in the UK at the moment, which they are, then surely in a sporting fight you'd want all of them to be fighting because all of them could potentially win it. And that's the good thing about the live scene is that everyone can do it, everyone can enter, and as such, anyone has a chance. Fantastic. One final thing I want to ask about the live scene, and maybe I'm accidentally caught in controversy here, I don't know, but you've spoken a lot about there being different sort of live event providers, and they're all obviously and quite rightly running as businesses that want to make a profit out of running their events so that they can run more of them and keep the hobby alive. So is there an element of competition between them or are they largely sort of running in harmony for the good of the sport? I'd say they run in mostly harmony. Um, a lot of the people who fight at XR will fight at Robots Live. I fight, I fight at both of them. If both of them are on the same weekend, it's basically whoever's closest wins. Um you know, it's one of the things where they're not trying to trip over each other's toes because at the same time, they're trying to use the same pool of resources. The more volunteers they can get coming, then the better their show is going to be. And as such, they, you know, they try to, I imagine they try to work with their schedules as best as possible. It doesn't feel like there's any one uh, team who will say, right, I'm going to go to this event and not go to any of the others. It tends to be uh, just personal preference for some people maybe some people say oh, you know, I can only attend one or two events a year as such I might go Robots Live because there's only going to be two or three of them a year anyway um, it can just be simple things like that maybe sometimes that maybe have personal preference people have but I don't see any animosity against each EO they actually attend each other's events as well sometimes Excellent, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that because again I think any time you're in a niche space, like Robot Combat really is off TV, and any sort of animosity within it can break it down so quickly. I suppose the thing to do now is move on to the other weight classes, because you've mentioned feathers and beetles and ants in particular a fair bit as we've gone through. What other weight classes have we got, and how active are they? So the main active weight classes in the UK would be nanobots, which are... Uh... 25 grams, I believe. Flea weights. 25 are... grams? Yeah. What earth can you build in 25 grams? Remarkably much if you're shaky. <laughs> <laughs> That's ridiculous. That's uh, genuinely unbelievable. I'm struggling with 150. Is there a size limit on those on those tiny ones? I, I, I don't compete at that scale, I'll be honest. Um, okay. <laughs> it, the, 25 grams. The, normally when I see them, it's normally when I see Alex Shakespeare. He's... He's the master at all things insect weights, really. Um, so, yeah, so we have nanos at 25 grams, I believe. Uh, flea weights are 75 grams. Then ant weights are 150 grams. Now, those three robots tend to all go to the same event of like, the Ant Weight World Series. The ant weights are the only ones with their own dedicated events. So they'll be the main event at that event. Then the flea weights and nanos will go along with them. Then we have beetle weights. Again, they have their own dedicated events, but they also can be found regularly at heavyweight events, especially Robots Live. What's the what's the weight limit on a beetle weight? So they'll be one point five kilos. Uh, we then have feather weights, which are thirteen point six kilos. Um, those are found pretty much at every heavyweight event, um, as well as having their own dedicated championships in the NEC and so on. And then obviously heavyweights at one hundred and ten. What was the uh, what was the weight limit on a lightweight? So a lightweight. If I remember correctly, at 25 kilos, uh, we don't really fight lightweights anymore, purely because the way it tends to work out, a lightweight is effectively just a very badly designed featherweight. <laughs> they, they, t they, they tend to use pretty much, pretty much the same components. They're basically just big feathers. You know, If you're going to build something of that kind of pool of resources, you might as well just put it into a featherweight. It's no point trying to spread people out that much. So there's a... There's a big gap there then between the, the featherweights are what just over 13 kilos and then there's a jump basically up to 110 for the heavyweight the thing is as well with if you take a middleweight for example a, a good middleweight platform will be a pair of boshes and you know it's just some batteries and a speed controller which really is probably a good it's a low level but decent drive setup for heavyweight i mean my heavyweight runs on that setup at the moment so, so when you when you say when you say Bosch is, is that basically just a drill motor? No, those will be um, I believe they're refrigeration unit motors. They're the seven hundred and fifty watts, the things that Chaos Two used to run them. Okay, but it just, it's just a case that if you're building a lightweight, it tends to just be a very heavy featherweight. And in the same sense, if you're building a middleweight, you're effectively building a very light heavyweight. 
there's no real niche. They're not they're not using some components which would be bad for the bigger weight class or bad for the lower weight classes. It's they tend to just use um, either bigger versions of the smaller weight class or just smaller ones from the higher weight class. Of course, as I think you're quite aware at this point, our main interest right now is kind of in amp weights. But I know that you've been doing a lot of beetle weight work as well. So what competition was it you've just been running? Uh, so we've done the University of West England Beetle Brawl. Um, basically, students, uh, society, robo society at the university, they wanted to run a beetle weight competition. Um, that's what we've done there. So in that competition, or in the scene in general, what are the dominant designs for beetle weights? Um, beta weights tend to come into two main categories. It's kind of hard to get pneumatics in those sizes. So you tend to a lot of the successful ones recently have either been spinners, uh, especially vertical spinners uh, like Tempus or RPM, and then you also have your RAM bots like Limp XS or Incomplete Control. Then some of them have their own little um, add-ons. So Incomplete Control is a very unique robot. It's a four-wheel drive tornado-style pusher with a little coat hanger on top. And it uses the coat hanger to basically grab down on top of robots, get into little holes on the top panel, hold on to them and then drag them around the arena with. I think I have seen that in a couple of videos and it looks like it shouldn't work and then it really does. <laughs> then there are also some lifters as well. Uh, we're starting to get some pneumatic flippers as well, hopefully. But obviously the, what, the arm on them tends to be quite light. Uh, I know a... I've forgotten the name of it, unfortunately, but I think it was Jamie McCarg uh, got to second in the UK champs in 2016 with what was basically a mini apocalypse. I think it's called Flatulence uh, in Beta Weights, which is, um, <laughs> it was a lifter. It's Ryan's kind of name, that is. <laughs> it really is. I'm hoping I remember the names correctly. I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to give us credit as much as I can, but <laughs> at the same time, it's a lot to remember. <laughs> the, the one thing that's always struck me whenever I've watched beetle weights or really feather weights as well is that the power to weight ratio of them is insane and yet the robots themselves seem to take the hits much better than say a heavyweight would in an equivalent impact what are the odds of going out in a beetle weight competition and your robot coming back in pieces never to be seen again um well i know that at the european championships someone entered a connects robot and that was in many pieces <laughs> um so, but yeah, it it tends to be a case that if you build it well enough and build it sturdy enough, then certainly with the higher power to weight ratios, when something hits it, it'll just go flying. And going flying doesn't tend to damage it so much. It's when it stays still and the mo and the weapon truck just goes through it instead that that's when you can cause the real damage. Because obviously with a heavyweight, in order to make a heavyweight go flying, you need a lot of energy. So they tend to just prefer to stay there and just get ripped apart instead. You'll see at ant weights, for example, two spinners may hit each other and they go across like uh, tiddlywinks just flying across the arena. <laughs> <laughs> just to hypothesise then, if you built a heavyweight that has the same power to weight ratio as, as one of these beetle weights, for example, that could use a spinner to send another heavyweight flying, would you, do you reckon that would be less damaging to the other robot because it's because it's sort of a it's not absorbing as much energy is sort of like flying around or, or do you reckon that would because that, that seems to me like that would be more damaging still like if you've got that much energy you're just going to tear that robot apart i mean the, the way you may think about it is say with drums for example they're spinning at extremely high rpms but they only really tend to grind on their opponents um if you is this a matter of engagement you mean yeah it's it's not so much the engagement but it's a case that if you hit something so hard, I tell you what, imagine if you was to kick a ball, uh, kick a football, for example, and we're going to measure this on the case of how much it hurts your foot. If you kick the, if you kick the football <laughs> at a goal, it doesn't really hurt your foot. Maybe if you do it several times really hard, you'll start to get a bit of um, a repetitive strain injury, yeah? Now, imagine trying to kick a bowling ball down the alley. That's going to hurt, isn't it? <laughs> I'm just struggling to imagine that Sam has ever kicked a football, to be honest. I've kicked footballs. <laughs> Once or twice. It's one of those things where that is going to hurt your foot really badly the harder you do it. Just because the bowling ball is not simply not going to move. Mm. That's probably the best analogy I can really think of at the time. So I, I suppose the reason I asked that question in the first place is that you were saying earlier that in heavyweights it's not practical to go out maybe once a month and face spinners and come back in pieces. In theory, is it 
almost a safer bet to be making something like a beta weight or an amp weight, knowing that you can go in for full combat and come back in reasonable condition most of the time. Well, say like and weights, for example, I do know people who are basically just have a 3D printer which can print the entire robot, and if it gets destroyed, they just print off another one for overnight. <laughs> you know, and that'll cost them about £10, maybe. They're living the dream there. Yeah, whereas with a heavyweight, for example, um, you know, you got it's, it takes a lot more time to assemble it, and it's a lot more expensive in terms of material. I, I remember, for example, watching a video of um, Tor and Tom, uh, Tom from Torn, uh, with his spinner that basically just self-destructed because a pin came out. And he had... It, <laughs> he had Oh, the Tim Rackers yeah, experience, by any chance? that was the one. And he had he had a new one the next day. <laughs> I was going to say, I think with our outweight builds, we're certainly not at that level yet. <laughs> so far from it. But I seem to recall, in an unrecorded conversation, you did mention that, was it a laminated cardboard robot had managed to win outweight tournaments? Yeah, so I, I, I believe it's called the Yoinks. It's um, a pink, fink, um, pink uh, pig-themed robots. Uh, I believe they're the current AWS champion. I know that they've done very well in the past, at least. Um, but again, yeah, they're. I think they're made out of laminated cardboard, and they're basically just very well driven. And because obviously you ca- you can't really get the engagement on uh, ants so much, then the damage is easy to repair, and it's. Uh, it's light as well. They're quite big robots because they're made out of lot, quite light materials. It's just mad that I, I must admit that when I first started thinking out weight, my whole concern was how do I stop the important bits getting broken? Or should I say the expensive bits getting broken? I, I'm guessing that it is very much important to go into any weight class knowing that there's every chance it's going to get completely smashed. Well, I'll tell you what, what when I sent um, the ant weights that Shaky makes to my university, I've got five of them from him, uh, which I've then sent them for a project. They asked me, you know, um, I, f- I think they're looking into maybe running it as a course of some kind. Like, they're saying, how do we move it into proper materials? I'm like, well, for ant weights, these are proper materials. It's all about the density of the material more than anything else. The, obviously, if you start using metals, you effectively have to use titanium because if you start making the thing out of steel, it's going to have to be so small and so thin that it's just you. You need to really look at the properties of what you're making. This is making me reconsider my uh, my thoughts of using aluminium. Aluminium's a good one. Um, it's quite easy to work with relative to tie. Uh, not as strong as tie, but obviously it's quite light at the same time. So. But are the other metals strictly necessary? Because you're talking about like cardboard robots that are winning and stuff. Is 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 a metal? Is is it necessary? I guess in ant weights, or is it just sort of like a uh, look at me? I've built a metal ant weight. <laughs> there are there are certainly all metal ant weights, um, but they're not they're not as common as say in heavy weights where literally everyone is metal. Um, then certainly in ant weights, for example, a lot of the ones I see purely because shaky builds them all um it's made out of 3d printed and polycarb yeah would you would you think that in my head like a metal a metal armored ant weight is going to be tougher than like an abs ant weight but is is this just a an assumption i have because i don't know anything about these materials or is this like a somewhat accurate thing to have assumed it is somewhat accurate i mean certainly i've got um a spin um i've got an, an ant weight at the moment which is completely destroyed because the printing just got destroyed by a spinner However, at the same time, it's just so easy to replace that you kind of don't care. I'm sort of like amazed to think that 3D printing can work at all for these things because um, I would think it would be weaker where the like because it's obviously it's layered plastic and I know it's sort of melted layer to layer. But I, you know, my limited experience with 3D printing, I think where those layers are like if you hit if you hit in the direction the layers are going, I think it's quite a lot weaker than if you were to sort of hit perpendicular to those sort of layers. You know. So I'm sort of like I'm sort of surprised that they are that they do that they don't just break very easily. But then I guess I guess like you said, they're so damn cheap and quick to replace. Then it's you know maybe maybe it's just don't don't think about it too much. Now I'm not a 3D printing expert. I don't have a 3D printer, so I'm not probably the best person to speak about 3D printing in general. However, the one thing I would say is that it it's good enough. Um, at the higher scales you go, the less usable it is. I know someone tried to use 3D printing just as a, a, an internal support for featherweight, and it basically shattered. Um, then beta weights, again, beta weight, unless you're, you wouldn't use it as external armour, but maybe internals to support things or 
to mount things down, it may be good, like for all your motor mounts or something. But generally, the bigger the robot, the closer you get to that point where it will start shattering if you put too much impact into it. So a final question for me would be, if someone is looking to get into building, thinking particularly about starting off at maybe ant weight or beetle weight, what sort of cost should they be expecting and what sort of skills are they going to need? It really depends on what level you're looking at doing it. I mean, for example, as we're saying with ant weights, you could, you can buy a kit from uh, Team Nuts, which basically does most of the things for you. Uh, then put some poly, um, polycarb or some cardboard around it, and you 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 have a, a, an ant weight effectively ready to go out the box. Then, if you wanted just a two wheel drive ram bot, uh, straight away. I think if if memory serves, the uh, the bots that they sell on nuts and bots were like seventy or eighty quid. I think. Yeah, so. I would say for an ant weight, you want at least £100. Um, then, obviously, you'd want a transmitter, but they can be cheap or you can get expensive ones. It's really a range. Um, personally, for example, I don't tend to use the cheap transmitters because I tend to find them not very um, sensitive enough and a bit uncomfortable to use. Obviously, because I've got so many robots, it kind of works out over the, <laughs> over the end just to get a decent transmitter. Um, so I just... just, just... So I just want to quickly correct myself. The cheapest robot they sell is 90 quid, and they got to 120. There we go. <laughs> Without a transmitter. Yeah, so if you want to buy a kit from Nuts and Bots, it is 120 quid. The actual components probably come up to about 90 or so. But yeah, with um, beta weights, again, you may want to do about probably about 200, maybe 300 pounds. But it's, it depends so much on what you want to do. Uh, so for example, for featherweight... Um, then I can, I I make kits for schools with the University of Greenwich. So, uh, what Trolley Rage actually was was the, the idea of making a legacy that we can take a heavyweight into schools, show kids this heavyweight that's been on TV, and it was built internally to be very, entirely recycled. Everything was very easy to see for a kid to learn from, and then we give them a featherweight kit. From then they can build their own featherweight and they compete in a championship uh, in September. Now, those kits cost about £200 each. Um, so, again, they're drill motors, they're Feather 2 uh, speed controllers, so they're very good quality stuff. There's nothing cheap about them, and they do the business. But at the same time, if you're wanting to be quite serious, you may want a bigger size motor, you may want a bigger size ESC, you may want pneumatics, for example. So, really, the price you're paying is really what your scope is. For a basic two-wheel drive RAM bot, at any weight class, then beetles or feathers, I'd say about two hundred pounds. Ant weights, maybe a hundred pounds, and that should see you through. Hmm. So, at the other end of the scale, without necessarily naming any names, because we know what happens whenever anyone mentions rapid. What is the sort of ceiling level that people are putting in to their robots? What's the sort of most people might be spending on, say, a beetle weight? It's hard to really think because a lot of the things, and with robots, the more money you spend, it doesn't necessarily make your robot better. I mean, for example, Rapid, the price we get quoted on the TV show is nowhere near what they actually spent. Oh, it's hugely inflated, isn't it? In the same sense, I think Mortis was considered, what, £25,000 in the original series or something? I think that, I think that's a figure they were quoting by series two, yeah. Um, whereas I saw a behind-the-scenes video from How to Build a Robot, I think done during series one, where they said they could build it for about 100 quid or something, something you know, reasonable. Because um, it's mostly donated parts. Um I think this is this is an interesting point about like the cost to build a robot because I I've I've gone through the process over the last few weeks of of build or prototyping the antway and stuff and I've started from from nothing like no materials no tools nothing and stuff so I've bought bought all the components and stuff which is you know like 70 or 80 quid and then it's like oh, I've got to go buy a transmitter and I bought one for like 50 quid in the end and then it's like I've got to go buy a soldering iron and then I've got to go and buy like a drill and it, like these basic kind of tools that I didn't have before and so there's like I think there's a big startup cost to this. I think this is going to be true even in the in the like the big heavyweights and stuff. Where if you do this a lot, I would imagine that you you acquire like a a a, a base effectively of tools, skills, and parts that you can use across robots. So I'd imagine that like if you've got a robot, you could you could quote it at twenty five thousand pounds if it was sort of like well I'm going to consider or maybe not, let's say let's say you quote the cost of a robot at five grand. And, and but that's just like if you were to buy absolutely everything new and then cost the time into it. Where, whereas whereas the team might have only spent maybe a hundred or two hundred quid maybe on on just buying the extra parts they they needed for that specific thing. But they already had 
like the, the drive motors lying around they already had a weapon motor they already had that the transmitter the receiver ESCs all that kind of stuff from other projects and stuff so it's one of those things where I think there's a quite a big startup cost I, I, I expect that over the course of building this antway I'm going to spend 200 maybe 250 quid overall is my current guess for what it's going to be whereas like the second antway that I build would be significantly less than that yeah so for example my transmitter costs say 100 pounds uh, for, but it's got a 10 model memory so for the next 10 robots i don't need to buy another transmitter Th then yeah as I was saying going back there there's a point where you're just spending money for money's sake it's not really improving the robot um so for example if you'll make the entire robot out of a single billet cnc on a six axis cnc and whatever entirely built for you from the cads that is going to cost a hell of a lot of money but at the same time what advantage does it give you compared to making it out of three pieces like tr3 is just bent into shape and then welded together i mean it may give some advantage but it's not going to be worth spending five or six times as much money on um and at the end of the day the driver is probably more important it, it sounds like as with basically any hobby like there's there's a point of diminishing returns you can keep spending you can approach infinity with your money but you're going to you're, you're going to attend tend towards and approach a much lower like number in terms of the performance i guess yeah there are certainly people who will spend two grand on a featherweight however that you know they've certainly not been uk champions to my knowledge um so it's swings and roundabouts in a sense a lot of the best robots in the uk are actually built on probably really quite reasonable budgets eruptions uh, to my knowledge, not an expensive robot, not certainly compared to Rapid, for example. So what is it that makes a robot a champion? I'd say the driver most important. Um, a good robot with a bad driver will not do well. Um, that's been proven time and time again when robots get sold onto someone and start doing either remarkably well after that or just completely fall off the face of the earth. Um, then I'd say the one thing I always look to do is you, ha you need to have a sort of USP. So what one thing that makes Explosion really, really good in the featherweights is it's really low design and it's got a double-ended ram, uh, which basically is the old style of doing it before we went to the gravity style rams, which is a lot more compact. It allows it to be a, a lot more angled and it's just basically a lot more efficient, but it also requires a lot more maintenance on, on it. Uh, again, Utopia, my featherweight, has a scoop on the front. It's the only full pressure scoop at featherweight level. So one of the things that can make you successful is doing something that no one else is doing. I mean, that's how Gabriel got so successful in the first place, for example. It was just simply doing something that no one had built their robot to counter. And as such, it basically just beat everyone because no one knew how to deal with it. Superb. Gareth, thank, thanks so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I think that is pretty much, for me at least, the ideal guide. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I feel like I've I've, I've learned a lot about the, uh, about the world of, of, of live live scene competing and stuff there's a lot more to it than i thought was going on really it's, it's very cool so yeah thanks as well for for coming on and, and talking to us about this is there anything you'd like to add i suppose i think it would be good if um certainly there's a lot of videos up on youtube people can start having a look through uh, maybe in the future for example we can start looking through championships to see how people do and look through the designs and so on of the robots it's one of the things where there's a lot of faces you will recognize in the the live scene so it's certainly worth at least coming down to watch, if you can, one of the shows. If not, just go on YouTube. There's so many there to see. and It's, it's obviously, if you're willing to watch a stream, then watching YouTube is even better because you get to skip all the, uh, the between the fights. You can find the show notes for this episode at spinnerproof.com slash episodes slash 24. And there you can find links to a bunch of the stuff we've been talking about. As mentioned earlier, the links to a tournament you can watch if you want to. And uh, you can also find a link to our Twitter at Spinnerproof, where you can tweet to us your, I don't know, favorite car in space. Way! <laughs>